Hi everyone. Uh, I want to start talking about the apartheid era today um, and really just get into some of the basics of it, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, the National Party in power um, and uh, its strategies and, and things like that. Um, subsequent uh, videos will deal with the uh, policies of the apartheid states, uh, the, the legislation, um, the uh, control of the police and the media and things like this that accompanied uh, the legislation, uh, as well as their international relations, uh, and also with resistance to apartheid. Uh, but that will come uh, in due course here. We need to lay down some groundwork, right, uh, to understand why this system takes shape, um, what, what the National Party uh, did to justify this and even grow in popularity uh, over the course of the apartheid era from 1948 to 1989 when uh, it began to dismantle apartheid. Um, the election of 1948 was treated in the last lecture, but let me just uh, recap that briefly. Um, uh, this was due uh, to a couple of factors. One of these is the unequal distribution of uh, population across the different voting precincts in South Africa. Um, rural precincts were um, uh, privileged in a way. Uh, the vote of the rural white person um, meant more than the vote of the urban person. Um, and this is how the National Party was able to gain a slight majority of seats in the South African Parliament um, and, you know, by forming a coalition government with some kind of rump parties uh, uh, left over after the um, retirement of J.B.M. Herzog, uh, the party of D.F. Milan um, was able to uh, have a majority, hold a majority of seats um, and thus a majority of cabinet positions uh, in the new South African government, right? And, and so in similar fashion to the way that, say, the Nazis came to power um, in the 1930s when they didn't really, they did not have a majority in the Reichstag. Um, uh, it was a, a set of negotiations, so to speak, with a, a very weak opposition. And the United Party in 1948 was extremely weak. They put up little resistance in the election campaign. Um, uh, so all of that led to this victory, um, but you know, despite that that very narrow majority, um, they began to put into place this incredibly repressive system of apartheid. Um, and uh, even though there was some resistance to this on the part of uh, some of the more liberal and progressive whites, um, uh, for the most part, the United Party was so defunct and so unpopular that it was not able to muster um, much opposition. In fact, the United Party over the course of the 1950s um, began to, uh, in order to, to curry favor with voters, began to take often positions uh, that were even more extreme in their racial views than the National Party did, right? So that was just uh, the, the way the political winds were blowing. Um, over the course of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the National Party grew in popularity to the point that they were pretty much able to eliminate all of their rivals. Uh, the United Party um, just faded out of existence by the 1970s. Uh, there were some other minor parties, but no party in the elections of the, of the 1970s was able to uh, muster enough support to gain uh, anything more than a handful of uh, parliamentary seats. Um, how did this happen? Well, the National Party came to appeal not only to Afrikaners, but also to non-Afrikaner whites. People of British origin um, uh, came to see the National Party as the only viable uh, solution to the wielding of power in South Africa. Um, and much of this uh, was due to the popularity, frankly, of apartheid policies, that even if people saw these as um, inhumane, unjust, repressive uh, in theory, they didn't, uh, when it came time to vote and, and uh, to choose uh, a party they would support, the National Party um, rode a wave of economic success and, uh, and general growth uh, of South Africa um, in numerous ways to command the vast majority of all of the white votes, right? Um, uh, no other party uh, had any anything more than a, a token uh, level of support. 
1961, and this is another kind of uh, key aspect of the uh, the ability of the National Party government to do the uh, as you know we would see it now unconscionable things it did. Um, the the government of Hendrik Ververt, uh, who succeeded, actually there were, he was the second prime minister after uh, Milan. There was a brief uh, time when a guy named Stratum uh, was prime minister, but that was only for uh, like four years. Um, uh, Hendrik Ververt was really one of the dominant figures, and I'll talk about him in just a minute here. But his government uh, uh, essentially passed a, a resolution stating that South Africa would henceforth be a republic independent of any oversight by the British. Um, initially, they intended to remain part of this organization that had come to be called the Commonwealth, uh, which included India and Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and others that had formerly been British territories but were now independent. But uh, criticism leveled against South Africa and specifically against apartheid by India and Australia and others uh, ultimately led, and, and not ultimately, it was in very short order, uh, led to uh, South Africa's withdrawal, even from the Commonwealth, right? So South Africa decided to go it alone, and it was able to do this because its economy was growing precipitously, uh, and this really realized the Afrikaner dream of absolute independence from the British, and, and even the, the formerly British population didn't put up much resistance. Key figures in National Party power uh, up to the end of the 1970s. Um, you know, the longevity of, of some of these figures is really quite remarkable. Um, and uh, it just goes to show how, how popular the National Party was that, you know, the, the leaders of the National Party remained in power for so long. Uh, Daniel Francois Milan, uh, who we talked about earlier, a former Dutch reform minister um, uh, and strict um, uh, segregationist uh, and so forth and so on. Um, a supporter of uh, Nazi Germany during the Second World War, even though you know he didn't uh, outright rebel against the decision to go to war on the side of the British, um, he had certainly uh, made statements uh, to the effect that South Africa ought to ally itself with Germany. Um, but uh, he was the leader of the National Party and, and a rather unified. Um, uh, National Party and, and was swept into power, uh, became Prime Minister in 1948. I think in the last lecture, which I did earlier today, I said he was the President. The position is actually Prime Minister, so we need to uh, be clear about that. Um, the architect, though, of apartheid and the one who really kind of broods over this whole era is the fellow pictured on the cover of Time magazine here, um, Hendrik Ververt. Um, and his name, uh, even in the mid-90s when I was living in South Africa, was everywhere. There were Fervert streets, there were Fervert neighborhoods, there is a city uh, near Pretoria called Fervert Berg. Um, I don't know if that's named after him directly, but the name is very popular there, right? Um, uh, so Hendrik Fervert is still, he was still a, very much a presence, um, so, you know, three decades removed from his death. Um, he was under Milan and under Stratum the Minister of Native Affairs, which meant he was responsible for the relationship between the white government and uh, the other groups in South Africa, the black Africans, the coloreds, the Indians, and so forth and so on. He, above all others, is the one who put into place the whole system of apartheid. He was the brains behind it, right? Um, and uh, remained tremendously popular. Um, uh, after the brief uh, interlude between he and Milan, uh, the prime ministership of uh, Stratum, uh, Fervert became prime minister in 1958 and remained in that position until he was assassinated in 1966. Um, uh, and, you know, he, he's, he's tremendously important. Um, uh, I'll talk, well, uh, at the end of this lecture, I want to go into, um, I want to sh watch a short video of him speaking about apartheid, and then I want to go into one of the documents in the Williams book. Um, but let's not do that right this moment. Um, the third figure here uh, is B.J. Forster, um, Balthazar Johannes Forster, uh, who was in the 1930s one of the kind of founding leaders of the Oseva Brandvog, the Oxwagon Sentinel. Um, 
It was this kind of paramilitary organization uh, of the National Party arising out of the centenary celebration of the Great Trek and all of that, right? Um, uh, and, you know, he um, was arrested during the war and actually interned because he was accused of sabotage um, against the South African government. Um, but uh, with the, the rise of Milan and the victory of the National Party, he was swept into power as well and, and held a variety of cabinet positions. Uh, when Favard was assassinated in 1966, he became the prime minister and remained that until his uh, he was forced to step down due to uh, corruption charges in 1978. Um, and so uh, these are really the three figures, and, and they are all of a piece, right? They, they all believed firmly in the superiority of the white race, um, in the necessity to separate whites and, and uh, people of, uh, of other races, um, in the whole uh, architecture of apartheid that we'll talk about. Uh, they were firmly committed to this, and they were skilled politicians in the sense that they uh, achieved a tremendous solidarity initially among the Afrikaners, but later uh, among all of the white voters. Right? Keys to success. Well, like it or not, um, and this is a hard thing to accept uh, for South African history, um, uh, the, the racial policy was one of the keys to the success. Um, even if people were initially opposed to apartheid on humanitarian grounds, even if they continued to speak that way, whites were extremely privileged, among the most privileged peoples on earth, uh, in fact, during apartheid. Um, they had an endless supply of cheap black labor that had absolutely no hope of advancing. Um, if the if the population of the blacks uh, got to uh, became too large, uh, if it was becoming unruly, uh, at least for much of, of this period, um, there were repressive measures to make sure that uh, those threats were eliminated. Um, either the police apparatus or the the apparatus of the justice system, or uh, simply the uh, system of removing people to what they called the homelands. Um, uh, and, and segregating them there um, and really not worrying over much about uh, what was happening to them in those homelands where conditions were barely, you know, uh, sufficient to sustain life and where things like the infant mortality rate were as high as they were any in any other part of the world. And this in a country that had a burgeoning economy that was uh, had one of, at least for whites, had one of the highest standards of living in the world. Uh, the people who lived, the, the blacks who lived in the homelands, uh, were among, uh, lived in some of the absolute worst conditions of anybody on earth at the time, right? Um, and so this was, this was so beneficial to the whites. They, you know, that they came to accept it and bought the justifications that were spun by Favert and others uh, about why this was necessary, right? And, and even probably came to believe that uh, not only whites, but blacks were better off uh, and we'll look at some of the rhetoric uh, that they use to, to, to sort of paint that, that uh, erroneous picture. The growing economy of South Africa is another key to their success. Um, and every sector of the South African economy was operating on all cylinders um, through much of the period in question. Um, there were setbacks. Uh, the energy crisis affected South Africa in the early 1970s. You know, I mean, there, there were times, uh, inflation in the late 1970s, uh, just as they affected other parts of the world, they affected South Africa. Um, but uh, the South African economy still grew by leaps and bounds. It paralleled that, uh, the growth of the United States, for instance, in the 50s and 60s. Um, and so, you know, if Bill Clinton is right in saying that, uh, Elections are won on the basis of the economy. His famous quote is, it's the economy, stupid, right? Um, not to call anyone stupid here, okay, but uh, I mean, when we get down to it, politics is largely around the success of the economy. Um, the, the National Party government is a good example of that. Um, the Afrikaners in particular benefited from this. Um, at the beginning of this period, the average Afrikaner earned about half as much as the average person of British extraction. Uh, by the end of the period, that would that gap was reduced significantly, um, and Afrikaners came to uh, be in prominent positions in uh, just about every area of the South African economy, in the mines, in industry, in things like uh, the media, um, as well as in positions of government. Right, um, and, and great strides were made 
uh, to sponsor Afrikaners. The, the government uh, became heavily reliant on uh, things like Afrikaner banks um, uh, and, and institutions that were controlled by the Afrikaners. Uh, is this nepotism? Yes, absolutely. Um, but uh, all of this was done to, um, with the rhetoric that the Afrikaners needed to be lifted up uh, from their impoverished and downtrodden position, right? This is, again, more of the rhetoric. Um, and, you know, given that uh, the economy was good enough uh, that all, of, all whites were benefiting from this, there was not a lot of protest uh, against this sort of corrupt dealing, um, at least not until somewhat later, as we'll see. The Cold War uh, was another key to the success of the apartheid regime. Um, the uh, National Party government seized very quickly on the line that uh, those who opposed apartheid were communists. In particular, uh, you know, entities like the African National Congress um, were, were communist in nature, right? And truth be told, there were some ties between the ANC and the South African Communist Party and more broadly the communist world in general, but this was not uh, unexpected um, given the, the the lack of interest, the lack of response from the the Western world uh, to the plight um, of the Black South African, right? Um, uh, this is not to say that the ANC members were communists, okay, but it was a convenient label, um, and uh, the Western world bought this. Uh, a succession of U.S. presidents certainly saw the prime ministers of South Africa as key allies. Um, the foremost among these probably was Ronald Reagan, who we'll, uh, who we'll talk about in a later lecture when we talk about the 1980s. Um, but, uh, you know, many South Africa, or many uh, U.S. presidents were, were key allies or saw the South Africans as key allies and looked the other way when it came to their racial policies. And given that, you know, there were, was a lot of racial tension in the U.S. during this period anyway, this is the period of the Civil Rights Movement, um, you know, that this is not unexpected. So, you know, that, that accounts for the National Party and its popularity. Um, and uh, rather than dive into the legislation of apartheid in this lecture, which is going to probably occupy a couple of uh, these videos, um, I'd rather leave it at that for now. Uh, but I do want to look at some examples of rhetoric here. Okay, the first of these is a very short video. Um, this is just on YouTube, okay, um, of Hendrik Ververt speaking about um, uh, apartheid and, and uh, why South Africa has a system of apartheid and why this is uh, an acceptable thing and all of that, right? So um, let's have a listen to Hendrik Ververt himself. Now, policy is one which is called by an Afrikaans word apartheid. And I'm afraid that has been misunderstood so often. It could just as easily, and perhaps much better be described, as a policy of good neighborliness. Accepting that there are differences between people. But while these differences exist, and you have to acknowledge them, at the same time, you can live together, aid one another, but that it can best be done when you act as good neighbors always do. Okay, so that was Hendrik Ververt, right? Trying to cast apartheid as a policy of good neighborliness, that uh, the whites and blacks are different and they must be kept separate, but they should act as good neighbors, live together, aid one another, um, and this is the key that, that's sort of implicit in that, develop separately. And this really goes back to the whole European rhetoric of the differences in development of the white civilized people and the savage or barbaric African people, right? That uh, sort of rhetoric continued to be used in an era when, you know, ideas about racial differences and racial discrimination were becoming taboo or at least being questioned all across the world. This is not to say that they were ever totally overturned. Um, as many recent events have shown, right? Um, but uh, the South Africans stuck firmly to 
this rhetoric, which was really more uh, a kind of 18th or 19th century line of thinking than, than 20th century. Uh, Favert himself uh, went into much more detail um, in this document uh, that appears in the Williams book, uh, starting on page 252 of that book. Um, and this is worth looking at in some detail, okay? Um, uh, and I, you know, would like to read parts of this. I might cover some of this in the, um, uh, in the live session that we do. Um, but, uh, one of the things that I'll point out here is this paragraph on page 253, um, where he writes, um, well, he, he says, now let's examine the question from the Europeans' point of view, right? Um, that, uh, if the Europeans, uh, need to be free to develop and, uh, you know, come to their, come into their own, uh, in our land. And if the Africans are in the way, the Europeans are not going to be able to develop and continue to be civilized, uh, to advance civilization as they are, right? Um, because the African, um, presence is corrosive to the process of civilization. That's the long and short of his thinking here. And then the next paragraph says this. My point is, is this, that if mixed development is to be the policy of the future in South Africa, it will lead to the most terrific clash of interests imaginable. The endeavors and desires of the Bantu and the endeavors and objectives of all Europeans will be antagonistic. Such a clash can only bring unhappiness and misery to both. Both Bantu and European must, therefore, consider in good time how this misery can be aver averted from themselves and from their descendants. They must find a plan to provide the two population groups with opportunities for the full development of their respective powers and ambitions without coming into conflict. Right, so he's couching this in terms of, well, if we live, if we live together and we try to develop together, there's going to be a clash of interests here. It's going to end in violence. Uh, so we need to be separate and be able to develop separately. The Bantu need to develop on their own timeline, right? This is back to the whole rhetoric of Africans being at a lesser stage of development, right? That this is going to be uh, uncomfortable for them if they're too involved with Europeans, if they're exposed too much to European ideas. Um, and the Europeans are going to be retarded in their growth if they have to have Africans in their midst and, and develop along with them, right? Um uh, and then, so he says, the only possible way is that we divorce these two lines of development from each other, live in separate spaces, uh, be given different things, and but then, you know, encourage one another uh, and help one another to develop. Now, this is so aloof and so naive about the African situation that it's, it sort of defies belief, right? He does go on to say that, yes, the territory that the black Africans have been given is insufficient for their proper development. So the white community needs to invest in these territories to help them, you know, uh, farm the land better. And, and so much of this is paternalistic and, and frankly insulting. Like he's like, where he says the Africans uh, simply don't know how to farm correctly. They're hurting the land. There's a lot of soil erosion. Uh, he leaves out the the obvious cause of the soil erosion, which is that the population of these lands is just too freaking big to sustain uh, itself, right? Um, that they've been over farmed because they're they're stuck on this these tiny pieces of land. Um, uh, so he says, well, we need to expose them to techniques very carefully that will help them become better farmers, right? That they're they're being wasteful right now. So we need to teach them, but this needs to come slowly because they're simply not ready to have uh, you know, all of these techniques given to them at the same time. Uh, they eventually need to be taught how to industrialize. They're not ready for that yet, right? And, I mean, the excuse, the convenient excuse in all of this, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little heated here. Um, uh, the convenient excuse is that the, you know, um, the blacks are simply not ready for any of this, right? And so they need to continue to live in these conditions until they're ready. Well, they, you know, according to the architects and, and uh, the continuators of apartheid, the blacks are never ready for anything, right? There never was any serious investment in the homelands or in any of the black communities. Uh, I mean, they just kept kicking the can down the road when these things uh, came up and, and uh, continued to use the same rhetoric that Fervert was using. I mean, I heard this stuff in the 1990s when I was there. Okay, so 
that's the rhetoric of apartheid. This is this is how they justified it, and this was accepted wholesale by the majority of whites uh, in South Africa. Um, again, even if some may have had some humanitarian feeling, and uh, I mean, you know, the whites were able to remain aloof enough from this. They didn't go into the townships. They didn't go into the homelands. They really didn't see. Uh, when they did, they, they, you know, blamed the blacks for the appalling conditions that they lived in. They said these people live like animals. Again, I heard that in the 1990s, right? I, oh, I went to this place where all of these black people live, and they live barely like animals. I mean, how can they possibly live like that, right? Well, never mind uh, the system that was put into place to oppress them is what created those conditions in the first place. Okay, I'll stop before I uh, keep going on about this. Um, so we will look um, in subsequent lectures again at the legislation of apartheid, the, the architect, or rather the architecture uh, of oppression, um, and uh, look at so the segregationist policies and, and uh, other aspects of this whole thing. It's a complicated system, uh, one that we need to be careful in examining.